for some players, those like Bob Lilly, Tony Dorsett, Troy Aikman, and Demarcus Ware, NFL success seems a foregone conclusion. Mark Tuane was not one of those players. Undrafted out of the University of Hawaii, his chances appeared slim. Yet Mark Tuane would beat the odds, convince the doubters, and indeed earn NFL success as one of the greatest offensive tackles in the history of the Dallas Cowboys. To not get drafted, to sign as a, as a free agent, as a rookie, and make the team, and then play five years at one position, and then switch to the other side of the ball and become an elite player at that position for 10 years. You know, that's unheard of. No one does that. Even Tuane's road to the NFL was unconventional. He grew up in Hawaii and got his start in football at Punahou High School. He didn't start playing football until freshman at Punahou. When he got to Punahou, came on the, on the bus, public bus, miles and miles, 60, 60 miles um, on the bus to get to Punahou as a freshman. Each day, Mark made a lengthy round trip journey across the island to attend the private college preparatory school, where for a time he actually played on the same basketball team as future President Barack Obama. Obama was a year younger than him at Punahou and they were on the team together. Matter of fact, Obama, I believe, is the one who said that Mark Tuane taught me how to set a pick and went on to be an um, all-pro left tackle in the NFL for the Dallas Cowboys. And that was one of the great stories that, you know, the coach got frustrated with the basketball team and he said, you know what, we're not practicing after school anymore, we're practicing before school. He goes, I'm tired of you guys, you guys are showing up, it's going to be the first thing of the day. And I don't want to hear any more about you being tired or anything like that. And he went through this whole rant and then he's like, oh my gosh, I forgot about Mark. You know, how's Mark going to get here on time from Waimea to Punahou for practice? And he said the only guy that wasn't late for a practice was Mark. On the football field, though, is where 2 a would truly shine, earning Hawaii's Prep Lineman of the Year award as a senior. And just for good measure, he also won the state shot put title later that spring. You don't get on that bus by yourself and leave your five siblings back home. You don't do that unless you're highly motivated and uh, a self-starter. Recruited by UCLA, Tuane would spend two years with the Bruins, starting at defensive tackle in his sophomore campaign before returning to his home on the island. There he would go on to join the University of Hawaii football squad. Despite battling injuries and seeing action in only seven games during his senior year with the Rainbow Warriors, Tuane's six foot five inch, 300 pound frame was enough to draw interest from both the Dallas Cowboys and the Boston Breakers who selected him in the USFL's 1983 draft. He had a coach from UCLA. He had to turn him down, which was uh, hard for Mark because he was a great, great mentor for Mark and Mark loved him dearly, but he took his chance. Um, with the Cowboys. In truth, a chance is really all it was. But despite there being more than 100 rookies invited to training camp, a chance was all 2 and a needed. Training camp in those days in Thousand Oaks was uh, six or seven weeks. But I looked at the roster of which rookies were still there from that original group of more than 100. And I thought, well, two and a still here. I, I guess I better pay attention to him. He couldn't have been a longer shot. Signed as an undrafted free agent in 1983, Mark two and a quickly caught the attention of the Cowboys coaching staff during training camp. But that didn't mean he expected to make the team. Oh, he said, uh, "Come, come to the last game. It's the last exhibition game, and we'll fly home together." And then Gil Grant called and said, how does it feel to be a Dallas Cowboy? Over his first two seasons, 2 a would primarily play on special teams while also seeing more time on defense, backing up the future Hall of Famer, Randy White. However, in 1985, the Cowboys decided to try Mark on the offensive side of the ball. You know, he was a defensive lineman and uh, that's a tough 
you know, conversion in itself. But he was just a really good athlete. When they first made the decision, because there was a void in the line, O-line, he was petrified. He, they put him at center first and never touched the ball. Punahou, UCLA, University of Hawaii. So moving to offense was uh, quite a feat for him to tackle. You know, really, once you dug into his past and you found out about his journey, um, you know, how hard that was and how hard that, that still is today to watch somebody that came in as a defensive lineman, you know, free agent uh, into an organization like the Dallas Cowboys and then they ask you to make the transition. It's gonna give you a better opportunity to be able to contribute to the team and you move from defensive tackle, defensive end, and then you go to left tackle for the position, which is you know one of the more challenging ones. It's hard enough to switch from one position to another on the same side of the ball. You know, certain guys can do that and that's impressive. But to switch from one side of the ball to the other and to not only make the switch, but to excel to that extent is extraordinary. He told me years later, and it may have been the year that he went to the Pro Bowl for the first time, he told me I'd, I'd still think like a defensive lineman. I'd still rather be playing defense, but he's, he was smart, and he understood what his path was to having a, a good and fruitful NFL career. If anything, his experience on defense actually helped Tuane once he was asked to become an offensive lineman. I think, you know, just watching him through his career, you could see the athleticism in the position. I mean, he was, it was, a, it was a great fit. It was a really great fit. And he had that that silent warrior mentality, um, you know, in that position. The athleticism, being calm, uh, but also being violent. During the 1987 and 88 seasons, the Cowboys stumbled to losing records. And to many, the offensive line was a big reason why. I was the butt end uh, of every fat joke in America. And, and Tui was the Hawaiian guy. Can he play at all? And so, you know, things weren't being saying nice. Uh, bringing Jimmy in uh, and, the, and his coaching staff was absolutely paramount to, our, you know, to us because it changed the whole culture. What they did was change the, the blocking scheme. Now, me and Tui, and they had quick feet, but just getting out running and pulling it. That, that wasn't our thing. And Jim Erkenbeck started changing that. He started, you know, the more one-on-one -on -one pass blocking, the more uh, deuce blocking with men and two, and they worked together going up to somebody. It was uh, Nate, myself, and Tui. We got, you know, we were the carryovers from the Landry era. We had a nice little bond uh, together. Now those three guys, particularly, two and A. Gogan and Newton, were still there in 1989 and 1990. And now you have a different coaching style and you have a new quarterback. And in 1990, you add a new running back. Then you add a couple other pieces. You draft Eric Williams, you get John Giesick. And literally within four years, the same guys who were the worst offensive line in football are now the best offensive line in football. You know, we did eat some, some you know, Loop 12, Cowboy 6 jokes for a few years. To me, it was obvious, man. There was a lot of talent in that room, okay? And time proved that to be correct. You know, Kevin Gogan played 14 years, Pro Bowl guard. Nate, 15 years, All-Decade team. Tui, 15 years, Pro Bowl You know what I mean? These, these are elite players, man. While the Dallas Cowboys dynasty of the 1990s was headlined by three future Hall of Fame players in Troy Aikman, Emmitt Smith, and Michael Irvin, the backbone of that potent offense would actually be the big men up front. And in turn, perhaps the backbone of that offensive line was indeed Mark Tuane. Everybody knows how important your left tackle is. That's the guy protecting your blind side for your quarterback. And Troy never worried when Mark Tuane was in the game. That's the toughest job on the field. There's no doubt he had to be one of the biggest competitors on the team because you're out there against the best week in, week out, whether you like it or not. I always thought that he was one of the more unknown, underappreciated players of those teams. Um, I don't think Bruce Smith had a sack in either Super Bowl. Um, you know, which is, you know, a feat unto itself. We turned our protection that way just, you know, as the backside of, you know, the quarterback, but we never 
left an extra guy and we never left a chip on Bruce Smith in that Super Bowl. We never did any of that. For a free agent to be able to handle that, that's pretty impressive. Can you go back and look at the guys in the NFC East when we played? The Charles Manns, the Dexter Manleys. These are guys that were borderline Hall of Famers are in the Hall of Fame. Great players who this guy was blocking week in and week out. With Mark on the left side and Eric Williams on the right, the Cowboys featured two of the best tackles of that era. We found Eric. They made to it. Tua got molded and take care of one side, and, and E. Williams were on the other side. I thought it was amazing, you know, how well he played in the big games, you know, the pass rushers that he went against. Uh, you know, everybody gets a chip now and then, but we didn't really, we didn't have to really worry about Mark. We didn't really have to worry about Eric all that much. It made me think about some games, right? Where I would have Eric and, and Tua, you know, and I'm out here talking. What? What you? I'm about to kill. What? And I'm talking to the defensive end, and Tui would be like, Michael, shut up. You're not going to You're not going to block him. I don't mind you talking. Just don't talk to my guy. I said, Tui, he's coming anyway. What difference does it make? He said, but don't you help him. You know what I mean? Don't help him. In addition to a pair of standout tackles, though, the Cowboys would boast having two of the NFL's best on the left side of their line. Man, this guy. I have a lot in common. Free agent, both played defensive line in college, both were fairly athletic guys, and then we wind up playing right next to each other. He benefited by playing next to a great player, mainly Nate Newton. That's two outstanding players next to each other for a long time. I mean, that's every coach's dream. I remember being at a Halloween party with Nate Newton. He came up to me and he said, Mr. Tuanay, does Mark sit around the house just bragging about himself? I'm like, no, who does that? <laughs> no, he said, this is doing a, he makes my job so much easier. He is fantastic. I remember that story distinctly. Uh, that was good of Nate. In my early years, I sat right next to him because I could not digest Coach Landry's office. And all the guys in there were trying to help me, but most of all, you know, two and eight was a smart guy, and I was playing next to him, so I needed him <laughs> desperately, you know what I'm saying? I guarantee you, they both made each other better. And there's a familiarity there. You know, when you play next to a guy for that long. I mean, I think me and Mark played together maybe six, seven years together. Uh, we were pro bowlers, we were all pros. I think we were, uh, as a unit, we were better than most guys we played with and against as a unit. Uh, we played well together. After more than a decade of playing in the NFL, Tuanay would finally be recognized for his outstanding work, earning Pro Bowl honors in both 1994 and 95. Back then, the All-Star event was held in Honolulu every year, meaning Mark also had the opportunity to return home to family and friends. Oh, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. I, every year, was, would just be so upset knowing that he got overlooked. And uh, so we were thrilled when he made the, he made, ended up making two Pro Bowls. Yeah, you know, I think he made the Pro Bowl in his 12th and 13th season in the NFL. And, and I remember saying, I mean, how do you do that? I mean, how do you, how do you play that long and not get the recognition? And then all of a sudden your 12th and 13th year, you know, when most people would look at a left tackle and say he's, a, he's in the, the twilight of his career and here you are playing your best football. From where he started, you know, walking on to, to, to where he got, you know, to where he got to play in Pro Bowls in his hometown, right in Hawaii. It's a walk on. You're going back home, a Super Bowl champion, to play in the game that honors the best players in the National Football League. You get to see the other side of that when he got to Hawaii and to see the, the community and all the Polynesians and Hawaiians, you know, kind of embrace him and, and love to have him back there. It was really, it was really amazing. It was wonderful for the family. The state of Hawaii, till this day, uh, remembers him um, as if he's still here. And that's pretty special.
Having an offensive line that played as one on the field was what led to Emmitt Smith becoming the NFL's all-time leading rusher. But make no mistake, the foundation of the Great Wall of Dallas was built off the field. One, two, three, come in. Everybody knows that talent alone won't win. Probably the most important unit of, on the team as far as having to work together, yeah. People talk about chemistry a lot, you know, and, and so we had that. Everybody said Hubbard Alexander had the hardest time with the wide receiver room. I, I would say no. I think it was the offensive line room that was probably a little bit more challenging to keep in line. There was a lot of fun in there um, uh, <laughs> on all the all the teams you play on. Offensive line group is the best group by far. There was no shortage of fun in those rooms. We, we had three jokesters, two and a Kevin Golden and myself. But the ultimate jokester was, was two and a because he could do it verbally, he could do it drawing on a piece of paper, or he could just sit there and look at you and give you a look that just will, will blow you away. Mark, tell us uh, what's going to be your weapon of destruction right now. Uh, well, my 170 club, which should just pop out of there for me. Where is it coming? Come on, 170. They're sleeping on me. Probably my forearm. Oh, you made it if it's the right distance, Mark. He was a great sketch artist, and the cartoons were unbelievable that would come out of that offensive line. And, you know, somebody as confident as he was in his ability to understand the game plan, you know, he, he probably got bored with Tony Wise's layout and, you know, presentation, and he's sitting in the back drawing, or, you know, killing time. Tui back there drawing pictures of Kevin Goffey. Oh, uh, either Mark Stepnowski, you know, uh, Geezy, John Geezy. Uh, he'll draw a picture of me, you know. He would have your face, but it'll either be on a motorcycle or he'll have you looking like a devil. He could draw and he, I mean, he, everyone thought I was the funny one, but he really was and they just thought it was me. Uh, he was uh, definitely hilarious. Uh, you have Coach Wise, like I say, eating a bacon sandwich, uh, uh, or built like the hamburger. I mean, he just was so good at drawing all these little different things. You know, Tui was very funny. Gogues had a tremendous sense of humor. Same with Nate. You know, just very funny, uh, talented guys. You know, um, great to be around them. Unfortunately, tragedy would strike both the Tui and A and Dallas Cowboys families. Two years after retiring on May 6th, 1999, Mark passed away from an accidental drug overdose. Worst day of my life up until that point. Um, you know, you mentioned it's, it's, you know, he's like a big brother, so, you know, it's like losing your big brother. That's not to it. We, we, we've been around to it. He's never done anything like that. It's just it was a one-time thing, like they said, that just happened and everything. He was one of the ones that, when that news came out, you just knew it was wrong. There was a mistake somewhere. That can't be. But I hate that people are thinking about that. You know, they'll think about that. And the reality is that that's not, that's not who he is. That's not who he is. There's something that he may have done, but it's certainly not who he is. I mean, I went, I would basically went into shock. You know, Diane handled everything. I mean, she was fantastic, you know, just getting the word out, letting everybody know so they didn't hear it from a third party or somebody else, you know, they could at least hear it from her. But I was, I was a mess teammate, a friend, but more importantly, somebody that, that helped me through times when, when I needed somebody to look to and showed me what the, the way to do things was and what it took to be successful in life. I got a phone call from uh, Daryl Johnston and his wife, and they told me. When we look when we look back at the different times that we've we've been with Mark over the years, uh, I, I think a smile comes to all of our faces because of the type of guy that he was and and the influence and the impact that he had on so many people. Um, and that, you know that's how that's how I'm going to choose to remember him as uh, uh, as the fun-loving guy that he was.
He loved Pono. He loved his family. And he, and he loved the Cowboys. I mean, you know, that you know, that's a family in itself. We all got cheated and, and that includes the, you know, that cowboy family too. God knows what happened. I don't think we all know. But God does, and I know where he is. And I'll see him again. In Hawaii we say Ahui ho until we meet again. A fierce competitor when the lights came on. A caring husband and teammate away from the spotlight. 2A was the epitome of a gentle giant. I would describe Mark 2A as the biggest, baddest, softest, sweetest dude in the world. You know what I mean? He really is. To this day, Mark 2A remains a beloved member of the Dallas Cowboys family. Not only is he recognized as one of the greatest left tackles in team history, but he is also remembered as a man who brought joy to those who called him a teammate and a friend. I was messing around, <laughs> signing autographs, having fun. <laughs> hey man, that guy was special, believe me when I tell you that. You'd have a friend for life, someone who'd give the shirt off his back for you. He was just one of those guys that had an outer exterior that you were kind of intimidated to get to know him. But once you did, I mean, he was, he was your best friend. He, he was an incredible man. He had um, a very incredible role around here and all the success and, and played an incredible role in a lot of our lives. He was fantastic to watch. He was fantastic to be around. He was someone who, when he was your friend, that was forever. And he absolutely was one of my favorites, always will be. Wow, you tell me which one I should wear. <laughs> they made it nice, I'll tell you what. I'd hate to get a three-peat. It's a tough one to beat. I thought this one was tough to beat. This one is definitely speechless. It's outstanding. The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show was presented by AT&T an official sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys. And by the Texas Lottery. Dallas Cowboys scratch tickets from the Texas Lottery are here. Play today. To honor Dallas Cowboys offensive tackle Mark Tuanay, donations can be made to Maui Strong for the victims of the wildfire.